Um, what I intend to do, first of all, is to very briefly indicate the scheme of these lectures, the intended objectives, and why they are structured the way they are. Um, as has been explained, I plan to deliver a series of probably about 10 lectures spread over as many weeks, with each lecture explaining some aspect of Indian law, including le legal principles, concepts, procedures, etc., in as simple language as it is possible to discuss law. The purpose of these lectures is to enlighten lay people on how the law can affect them and how they can, if they have to use the law, find their way in what can often be an intimidating landscape. Uh, I've structured these lectures uh, in the form of basic questions and answers, and I shall try to address perhaps a dozen or so Q&As in each session so that I don't overburden you with too much information each time. Uh, among the topics that I intend to cover in the series as a whole, not just today, um, are first of all an introduction to the Indian legal system, secondly how is law classified and what are the implications of that classification, particularly the difference between civil and criminal law, about which uh, generally speaking there is not uh, too much awareness. Um, also about how disputes are meant to be resolved, what are the different types of rights and what are the ways in which those rights can be realized, and that will uh, include uh, a discussion of public interest litigation. Um, uh, furthermore, also how is criminal law organized and applied? Um, some of the things that Swami just referred to. Uh, what is citizenship and what are the laws in that area? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll also have occasion to deal with particular issues of common concern or topicality, such as defamation, contempt of court, denial of official information, invasion of privacy, violation of copyright, etc. Um, now, if there are any additional topics that you think I should address, feel free to write to our friends at VHS and they will, I'm sure, give your suggestions all due consideration. I understand also that you will have the opportunity during these lectures to raise questions via the comments box in whatever medium you're watching and based on guidance that I get from the organizers, I'll try and try to answer as many of those questions. Perhaps I should at the very beginning lay my cards on the table and tell you in a sentence or two what I think of Indian law. Uh, it is possible that my views on this fundamental issue are at variance with the views of some of you, but I hope you'll agree that in a free society there should be room for differences of opinion. Quite simply, I believe that in most respects Indian law is fairly robust and fit for purpose, which is not to say that it is perfect or that there is no room for improvement. Quite the contrary, and I'll have occasion during these lectures to indicate where there are gaps, shortcomings, anomalies, inequities, etc. But a more important point that I want to make is that there is a huge problem in terms of enforcement of the law. The law itself is reasonably sound, but the enforcement is not. Uh, you're all aware of the glacial pace at which litigation moves in India, but that's only one part of the tragic story. Uh, I'll have occasion to point out many others uh, as we go along. Uh, in substance, as my late lamented guru Nani Palkiwala used to say, uh, India has too many laws and too little justice. So with those preliminaries over, let's plunge straight into the topic of today, which is going to be a fairly introductory topic. Uh, and I start with the question of how the legal system in India is organized. Uh, the first thing to say there is that the system is a hybrid system. Uh, it is best described as Anglo-Indian or Indo-British, uh, which rests on a bedrock of English common law, of course, as modified by Parliament over the years. Uh, and it includes a number of traditions uh, and techniques of interpretation etc. Uh, but the Indian system also recognizes and gives effect to other forms of law, such as those based on religion or custom, and these are collectively called personal laws. 
mostly in areas such as marriage, divorce, maintenance, succession, and inheritance. So if you want examples of those uh, in terms of statutes, you have the Hindu Marriage Act, the Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act, the Indian Christian Marriage Act of 1872, etc. Now, in relation to the Muslims, again, uh, there is legal recognition given to marriage, inheritance, succession, charities, and so on through the um, Muslim Personal Law Sharia Application Act of 1937. The general principle for recognition of personal and other customary laws is that they should not go against any statute or any of the widely accepted norms of morality, uh, which provides wide scope, of course, for judicial interpretation. It goes without saying that they should also not be incompatible with any of the provisions of the Indian Constitution. Now, again, generally speaking, criminal law is applied universally and not made subject to religious or other exceptions so that it would be unacceptable under the Indian legal system to, for example, allow Muslim offenders to be given certain Islamic punishments, such as stoning for adultery and so on. Uh, it is a principle which most people would agree uh, accords with fair norms of public policy. That hasn't, of course, prevented, I'm told, um, certain Muslim leaders from organizing Sharia courts in certain parts of the country. Uh, I was reading just two or three days ago uh, about this in the book on the Delhi riots. Um, you must be familiar with it, uh, authored by Monica Aurora, Chitalkar and Malhotra, uh, where I was told that in Northeast Delhi, um, there are some Sharia courts in operation uh, that clearly would be um, illegal, to put it bluntly. Um, I'm deliberately not going to, sp uh, to speak about the organization of the courts now because that topic will fit in better with my next lecture. Now, what are the sources of Indian law? In other words, where does Indian law come from? And I suppose um, it, it goes without saying that the preeminent source is the constitution. No law is higher than the constitution, nor can any law be made by any organ of state, including parliament, uh, to override or to be inconsistent with the provisions of the constitution. And that stands in very sharp contrast with the system in the UK, because in the UK, parliament is supreme, which means any law made by parliament, regardless of how absurd it is, would, would still be legal. Now, another important and in practical terms, more ubiquitous source of law are statutes, that is laws made by parliament. They're also called acts. Uh, it's important to note that all statutes have to conform to what is allowed under the constitution. Otherwise, they can be struck down by the courts. Again, something that cannot happen in the UK. Broadly speaking, um, any laws that are passed by parliament are called legislation. And it needs to be noted that that is also the word to be used in the plural. I come across many instances in India where people talk about legislations, which of course is rubbish. So legislation is what you call law passed by parliament. In India, you need to note that there are two levels of legislation making, central and state. Uh, each has its own sphere of competence and there are complex rules to resolve any disputes or clashes that may arise between the two, which I shall explain shortly. Legislation can be divided essentially into two types, primary and subsidiary. So what do I mean by this? Primary legislation is an act passed by parliament itself. But subsidiary legislation is law passed not by parliament, but by any other organ of state with the authority of parliament. So an example might be uh, an order of the commission of police under the Bombay Police Act. Uh, to ban certain processions. Now, obviously, Parliament won't have the time or the resources to pass such elaborate um, um, uh, pieces of legislation. So in those circumstances, power is given to the commissioner. Now, the important thing to remember is that when authority uh, is given to any organ or body to make subsidiary legislation, then that organ or body should never exceed that power or misuse that power. Because if they do, then they would be considered to be acting ultra virus. This is one of those 
Latin terms which you'll come across quite a lot uh, in your discussion of Indian law. Essentially, ultravaris means outside one's powers, acting outside one's powers. And if somebody does act outside their powers, in other words, act while ultravaris, then of course that can have serious consequences. A third important source of law is judge-made law, that is case law. Um, now, a question arises, can judges make law? On the face of it, uh, the answer would appear to be no, but actually judges do have the power under the Indian system as under the British system to make law, but their power to make law is subject to certain conditions. Now, I'll give you an example in India of how this is done. You might remember that in 1997, uh, the Supreme Court, Supreme Court of India, uh, passed what are called the Vishaka guidelines in relation to sexual harassment. Now, why did they do that? They did because there was a case that came before them in which the issue of sexual harassment arose. And they discovered that there was no law at that time passed by parliament on that subject. Now, the judges cannot leave uh, an applicant or a petitioner without a remedy uh, in such circumstances. So what they did was to draft certain guidelines and say that those guidelines will hold the fort until parliament makes law on that subject. Obviously, when parliament makes law, what the judges said will cease to apply. And that actually did happen. So you had uh, a law passed by parliament, I think in 2013, called the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace. Uh, it had a long title, Prevention, Prohibition, etc. Uh, so that is how um, uh, case law works. Um, I might also refer in passing to something similar that happened in 1996 when the Supreme Court of India in a case called PUCL against the Union of India gave elaborate guidelines on telephone tapping. What are the circumstances under which uh, the government can tap phones? Interestingly, unlike the Vishaka guidelines, those guidelines were not translated into law by parliament. So they still hold the field. Uh, to the extent that uh, common law can hold the field. Uh, and interestingly, there are whole areas of law in India which are entirely judge-made. So the law of civil defamation is totally judge-made. You do not have, for example, in India a law called uh, the Defamation Act. So it is judge-made. And of course, when, you, when I say it's judge-made, uh, understandably, it depends on English common law because that's a law that prevailed at the time of independence. Although the Indian judges do have the power to deviate from English common law if they feel necessary. Um, also other torts, the whole area of tort law in India is uncodified, that is to say, based on common law or judgment law. Uh, another example um, in, in this regard might be the law on personal privacy. Now, you know that there was this um, case of Puttaswamy not so long ago. Now, that is a very good example of judge-made law, and that is a law which holds the field uh, for uh, present purposes. Now, I'll deal with these matters at greater length in later lectures. The next question I want to address is, do all laws enjoy the same importance or value in legal terms? And the short answer is no. There is a hierarchy of laws with, of course, the Constitution at the top, now, the Constitution itself, as you know, is the longest in the world. It has 395 articles. Actually, the number of articles is uh, close to 450 uh, because you do have a number of articles with all kinds of um, A to Z clauses. So uh, what comes to mind immediately is uh, Article 243, which, is, um, which, which goes right up to 243ZG. So they've exhausted all the alphabets in the, in the English language and then begun a second suffix. Anyway, the, the constitution is quite large. It is arranged under 22 parts. And of course, there are also 12 schedules in addition. Now, underneath the constitution comes statutory law in terms of the hierarchy. And further down comes delegated legislation or subsidiary legislation. I've already referred to the concept of um, ultravirus which gives the courts the power to strike down legislation which is not compatible with the constitution. 
the courts also in India have the power to read down legislation. It's a very important power because sometimes um, there is a reluctance on the part of judges to strike down legislation. What they can then do is uh, read down a part of the legislation. This happened, for example, in the um, case uh, relating to homosexuality, section 377 of the penal code, uh, when uh, the Delhi High Court in the Nas Foundation case did actually uh, read down that section uh, to exclude consensual sexual acts of adults in private, uh, holding that they are a violation of articles 21, 14, 15, etc. Now, I mentioned earlier that if there's a clash between judge-made law and statutory law, then the latter prevails. Uh, so that needs to be borne in mind. Uh, so there is there is a, 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 a hierarchy there as well. Now, what is the basic framework of Indian law? Uh, India, like most democracies and free societies, places a lot of importance on the rule of law. Now, this is a concept which admits of uh, many meanings, and I don't have the time to go into it in any detail, but the essence of it for present purposes is that no one can act without the authority of law. So if a state functionary were to ask a citizen to do something or prevent him from doing something, then the citizen can demand to see the legal authority under which that functionary is acting. Um, another very important principle which underpins the Indian legal system is that um, every person is presumed innocent until proven guilty by his or her accuser. Uh, it is true that there are certain exceptions possible to this rule, but those exceptions are few and far between, and they also have to have the authority of law. What are the limits of the law? I think this is as important a question as the value of the law. So most of you, I think, will agree that law does play a huge role in the lives of all of us. But you reflect, if you reflect more deeply, you'll realize that the law is only one of the instruments to regulate human conduct in complex societies. There are other uh, instruments which are no less important. For example, the concept of dharma, which has always served as an effective guiding principle to influence people's behavior uh, for the good of society as a whole. Uh, then there is what may be called soft law. Uh, this is usually contained in codes of conduct. So to give you examples that you may be familiar with, you would have the Election Commission's Code of Conduct or the Press Council's uh, norms of journalistic conduct. Now, codes do not have strong sanctions attached to them like laws, but they can be effective. Uh, they operate on the principle of peer pressure, naming and shaming, uh, and sometimes even punishments like fines. Uh, and they also rely on a very important precept of obedience to the unenforceable. I would like you to remember that phrase, obedience to the unenforceable. Now, what is the importance of codes, uh, ethics, etc., in achieving the purposes which are similar to those of the law, so essentially justice and fairness, and how can they be used in practice? I would say that it's easy to be cynical about the effectiveness or the practical utility of codes of conduct, but I would argue that they do have a value and should not be dismissed lightly. But I agree that soft law only works in societies which are highly disciplined and where norms, um, or where there's you know, a high degree of respect for norms, conventions, traditions, etc. Don't forget that even uh, within the formal legal system, there is some room for the use of codes. Uh, besides, judges do have the power to rely on equity, which is another source of law uh, that I forgot to mention earlier, and which is based on the concept of fairness. So if in a given, in a given case, the strict application of the law would result in a degree of harshness that would by uh, reasonable standards be considered unwarranted in the facts of a particular case, then the judge can use equity to reduce that harshness. And it is being used repeatedly. There are so many instances which we don't even care to think about where equity has been used by judges, sometimes without actually saying so. What happens if there's a clash between law and ethics? This is a question which pops up in almost any society. And the short answer there is that the law always wins. Um, so a telling example is that of confidentiality of a journalist's sources. Now, most codes of ethics say that a journalist should always respect and protect 
the confidentiality of his sources. But if a case was filed against a journalist, say for the breach of the Official Secrets Act, and he was ordered by the court to reveal the identity of his source, he cannot rely on the requirement of any journalistic code of ethics. Uh, this gives rise to the important principle of what is legal is not necessarily ethical, uh, which, which of course I shall elaborate on in a later lecture. Another example of a potential clash or at least divergence between law and ethics is in relation to personal privacy. So under Indian law, it's not an offense to take a picture of someone who is in a public place and even to publish it as long as it's not published in a defamatory manner. But if you believe in ethical behavior, you will always seek the permission of the person you wish to take a picture of before taking the picture. Uh, there are many such examples where ethical norms do not always coincide with legal rules. Generally speaking, however, there is an expectation in most societies that the law will have an ethical grounding, uh, which in turn often means a reliance on moral or even religious tenets. Uh, in India, of course, Dharma assumes an important role and that is reflected in frequent calls from saints and societal read, uh, leaders for uh, all laws to be based on the principles of dharma as understood and widely accepted for centuries. Um, a disconnect between moral and ethical values and the law has often led to friction in society, uh, even in highly materialist countries. Now, what are the respective roles of central and state law in India? I mentioned earlier about the two levels at which law operates in India. The first point to make is that India is supposed to operate a system of cooperative federalism under yeah. which although the states and center assign specific roles and powers, there is a need for a lot of give and take between the two. In practice, of course, there are frictions, even clashes. Formally, the constitution lists certain matters which are exclusively within the power of the center to legislate upon and certain matters which are exclusively within the power of the states to legislate upon. Yeah. There is a third category of matters which is left to both the center and the states to legislate upon depending on the exigencies of the situation. This category is contained in what is called the concurrent list. I would argue that in practice the center has the upper hand over the states. Now, how the potential clashes between the two result? Um, I would refer you to an article in the Constitution, which is Article 254, which deals with this issue. The main principle is that where state law is inconsistent with the law passed by the center on the same subject, the central law will prevail. However, there is a pre-existing, uh, sorry, you can have a situation where there's a pre-existing central law and the state introduces a new law on the same subject, then if the state is able to receive the assent of the president, which in practice means the concurrence of the union government, then the state law will prevail over the central law, but only within the boundaries of the state. Uh, and this is as a result of the second clause in Article 254. Now, this provision actually came into focus as recently as last week when it was suggested that those states in India which were unhappy with the reforms on farming, which were introduced, as you know, by the central government through legislation passed by parliament uh, about a week or so ago, now that they should try to nullify the effect of those reforms by resorting to Article 254, Clause 2. Uh, whether that tactic will succeed remains a moot point, given that Article 254, 2 can only be revoked with the permission of the central cabinet, uh, because the president has to heed the advice of the cabinet while granting any assent to state legislation. I think I've taken up most of my time, probably exceeded my time, so I'm going to con conclude very, very quickly and say that um, in this lecture, I've tried to give you some idea of where the law comes from, what is the basic framework of Indian law, how do legal ro uh, rules operate at different levels, uh, where do codes of conduct, that is soft law, fit in, uh, what is the relationship between law and ethics, and so on. In my next lecture, I plan to address such issues as what are the differences between civil and criminal law, how the courts are organized, 
what you should know if you're required to seek re recourse to the to the courts uh, a point that Swami made at the beginning of this um, session uh, and I hope that you found this lecture beneficial um, I'll conclude just by thanking you all again thank you Dr. Venkat Iyer for that informative uh, initial first lecture talk on the series which we are going which we have started from today that is every Saturday at 8 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Uh, I would like Dr. Swami to make some comment before we end the program. Uh, over to Dr. Swami. Yeah, so he's given us a general, uh, as he himself said, and now he'll get into the specifics. Uh, some of the um, uh, things which people ask me, I will ask you now, you can answer it at, uh, at a later location. This is just a way of saying that in the future lecture you should be built it in it may be a little out of step with the normal flow that you have uh, created just now if the government does something wrong i as a citizen do I have a right to sue the government if so under what law or is there a law uh, is there a section in the constitution an article in the constitution which empowers me number one Number two, a uh, question that most people ask me here and there, and especially after the Ram Mandir matter. Can a government take over the land of somebody for a public purpose? And if so, if, are there any limitations on that? Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, these two questions lead to the power of the individual over the government. We, you have just now spoken very eloquently about the power of the government over the people in what it is lodged. But what about the power of the people over the government for a mistake they make or the action they take such as uh, a, 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 such as, as taking over of your land. There's a then I might ask you sometime in the future that there is a law which the parliament passed in 1991 to say that all religious institutions are inviolable in the sense nobody can take them over or demolish them if they were standing in 19, on August 15, 1947, with an exception that as far as the Ram Janmabhoomi is concerned, this law will not apply to that. Why only Ram Janmabhoomi? Why not other places where there is a demand? For example, Kashi Vishwanath, Mathura. In fact, somebody went on a suit recently. I think therefore yesterday the court said I am bound by this 1991 act, uh, Places of Worship Act. So um, uh, is there any way to get around that act or consider it for some reason unconstitutional and have it struck down or force the court to make two more exa exceptions, Kashi Vishwanath and um, uh, Krishna Janmabhoomi in Mathura. So these are the kind of questions I get asked, you see. Uh, so somewhere in your lecture you should bring it in or we could have you you speak, uh, you know, you are mindfully on this question and then later on you and I will have a question answer session. If that's okay with you. Yep, absolutely right. Uh, and then we'll invite also all the people who are watching. Please send questions. Yep. And I will uh, filter them and yep. then ask them those questions. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, quite a few of those uh, involve a very uh, sophisticated analysis of the law. Uh, yeah. For example, the 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 the, um, the one of the earlier points you made uh, about. Um, um, where do you get the right if there is such a right for citizens to sue the government? And it's actually a, a quite a complex question 
which requires a, a, a very elaborate answer. But there is yes. an answer, and actually it also involves a degree of creativity in the application of the law. So yeah. there is no, I mean, a short answer to your question will be there is no single article in the Constitution which directly confers a right on a citizen to sue the government directly, except in, in limited circumstances, but in general terms. And normally, of course, you would resort to the law of torts, which is you suffer a, 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 a harm, uh, for which you you um, get a remedy, but equally interesting, you can use constitutional law as well, except that you'll be using it indirectly and with a great degree of sophistication, because there's a very important common law principle called ubi just ibi remedium, which means when there is a law, there has to be a remedy. So when there's a right, there has to be a remedy, and therefore it is possible to argue, for example, that Article 32 of the Constitution, which confers the right on any person to uh, enforce his fundamental rights, then that right is useless if there was no um, substantial remedy. Uh, so issues of that sort, I'll be very happy to engage with those kind of questions in future lectures. And I think we should actually be able to also take questions from others. And I'll say quite uh, humbly, also it's possible that my views may differ from those of some Indian lawyers. Very happy if they wish to debate those issues with me because that's the only way we all learn. So quite happy to adopt the uh, the um, uh, template that you seem to suggest. Well, I just want um, uh, when you are so uh, have a look at Article 300, and please interpret it for me. Yeah. OK. Article 300. Yep, yep. OK. OK, friends. Thank you, Dr. Venkat Iyer and Dr. Subramaniam Swami for your valuable inputs and uh, setting the tone for our future lectures and laying the foundation for the coming series on the legal words of wisdom, Nyai Gyan Ganga, for the benefit of our viewers. I once again request our viewers and in English to inform our VHS members that every Saturday, We'll be on this show at 8 p.m. Indian Standard Time. So keep tuned in. Our regular show on Sunday at 8 p.m. will continue. But this will be on the legal issue on Saturday at 8 p.m. And our regular show on Sunday also will continue. I thank questions also. And uh, you can always reach out to us uh, via our website and uh, via what will be scrolling on your screen through that method you can reach out to us. Our basic idea is to educate the common man on the importance of law and have a knowledge of the law so that they can effectively use it as a weapon. I once again thank Dr. Venkat Iyer for devoting his valuable time and Dr. Swami for being the inspiration and giving us guidance on this which he has been doing over a period of time, but today we have, have a platform to educate the common man and our members on the importance of uh, importance and the knowledge of the law. So I thank uh, Ramesh uh, Swami for uh, uh, putting this program and the technical team led by Ashish Shetty, uh, Ishwar Iyer from Navi Mumbai. Then we have Tejas from Pune. We have Vishal Mehta from Mumbai. We have Swaminathan from Chennai and we have Rakesh from Bangalore who are the support team and my colleagues in VHS for their valuable inputs and support for putting this program together. So with this we end today's episode or we say legal series and our uh, next uh, date will be on next Saturday at 8 p.m. But we'll continue with our Sunday show of words of wisdom, Gyan Ganga, the normal show on tomorrow, the sa uh, Sunday, uh, we'll be there with Dr. Swami on an interesting topic. So do keep tuned in for our two weekly programs on Saturday 8 p.m. and Sunday at 8 p.m. Uh, Indian Standard Time. Thank you, Dhanyavad and Jai Hind.